Welcome back. This is part two of our six-part series on how to read your MRI of the lumbar spine. I'm Dr. Andrew Brown. In our first part of the series, we described how to install a DICOM viewer. And we also described some basic components of a lumbar MRI. In this video, we'll discuss intervertebral discs, their anatomy, and some problems that can arise. So to start, we're going to come back to our micro DICOM viewer. And if you've forgotten how to load your CD into the micro DICOM viewer, uh, you can go back to our first video for an introduction. So before we start looking at the intervertebral discs, what I'd like to do is to talk a bit about how to count vertebra. And counting vertebra is actually crucial to reading a lumbar MRI. When you read a report from your radiologist, they'll often comment on the level at which a particular problem occurs. And in order to understand what level the radiologist is talking about, you have to know how to count vertebra. And one of the, the basic ways to do that is by looking for the T12 vertebra. So there are 12 thoracic vertebrae. And the way in which you can distinguish the T12 vertebrae from the other ones is if you roll to the very edge of the image, you begin to see here the T12 rib. And so that is going to be a pretty consistent landmark of the T12 vertebra. And from there, you can start counting lumbar vertebrae. So T12, thoracic vertebra, number 12. Lumbar vertebra, number 1. Lumbar vertebra, number 2, 3, 4, and 5. Why it's important to count vertebra this way is you can sometimes be fooled, because sometimes the fifth vertebra might actually be fused with the bones down here, which are part of the sacrum and a process called sequelization. So being able to count the number of vertebrae is actually pretty important in case there are some sort of vertebral anomalies um, that can confuse you. So if you can find the little nub in here that tells you that that's the T12 vertebra, and you can count from there one, two, three, four, five lumbar vertebrae. Now that we know how to count the vertebrae, let's move on to the intervertebral discs. So the intervertebral discs are essentially the material that lies in between the vertebrae. So we talked about these being the vertebrae. And here are your intervertebral discs. Now, the intervertebral discs are important because they provide a shock absorption function for the spine. So there are two components of each disc, the first of which is the center, which is the shock absorbing material, which is called the nucleus. And it is surrounded by a ring called the annulus. And if we look at our Axial, remember axial is sort of the, the transverse section of our spine images. You can see that you have a center, and the center is your nucleus, soft shock absorbing material, and on the outside you have your ring, which is the annulus. Now there are many different problems that can arise from the intervertebral discs. I will only describe a few here. Be sure to talk to your doctor about your specific situation. In this spine, there are signs of early intervertebral disc degeneration. One example is a loss of what's called fluid signal within the nucleus. And this is a sign that collagen content in the nucleus is increasing, making it a little less spongy. We can tell this process has begun because the central portion of the disc has become darker and begins to lose some of its original height. And this is seen well on the T2 weighted images. Another common problem is herniation of disc material. Now, herniation really means that there's a displacement of disc material beyond the limits of the intervertebral disc space. Interestingly, there are two fundamental directions in which this can occur. Most of you are probably familiar with the idea that intervertebral discs herniate into the central canal and can impinge upon nerves and other structures. We see a tiny bulge here, but it doesn't seem to impact any of the surrounding nerves, which is good. There is a rich literature around how to describe different types of herniations, which is beyond the scope of our discussion today. But discs can also herniate in the perpendicular direction. They can herniate up or down. And these are called Schmoll's nodes, and they are quite common as well. They're often identified in asymptomatic patients, patients without pain, but can also occur in the context of infection or previous trauma. 
In this video, we talked about how to count vertebra and how to examine intervertebral discs. In the next video, we'll talk about facet joints and facet arthropathy. For more information on this video, check out the link below to our blog at askwillem.com. I'm Andrew Brown. We'll see you next time.